Hi, my name is Vincent, and I'm a machine learning engineer over at Explosion. In this video, we're going to explore bulk labeling once more, but this time around, we won't use it for text classification. We'll apply it for image classification instead. It turns out that we can apply the same bulk labeling trick in computer vision. But in this video, I hope to show you how bulk labeling works just slightly differently uh, when you're dealing with images. We'll see how the domain of images creates some unique challenges, but we are going to address them by using a very powerful fine tuning technique. One that allows us to improve the bulk labeling workflow by just annotating a few examples in Prodigy. I hope all of this sounds pretty exciting, uh, but let's start by discussing some theory first. So just as a recap, the way the bulk labeling worked for text is that we started by taking some text and by embedding it. We would take a pre-trained language model, which could take that text and turn it into an n-dimensional vector that would represent this text. The next step would be to take this vector and to turn it into something that we can plot, something that's two-dimensional. And for this, you would use a reduction technique. The technique that we typically like to use here is called UMAP, but the main important thing is that we go from a n-dimensional vector to a two-dimensional one that we can visualize. Then when you visualize this, hopefully, um, you will make a scatter chart where each text is a dot, but then you will also see that there are some clusters that appear. You can explore this space, which is definitely kind of nice because you can maybe understand some topics, but you could also make some selections. Uh, and this way of working, this technique, allowed us to get a very high level visual overview of the embedding space. And because it also allowed you to make these selections, it was a pretty neat pre-processing workflow for Prodigy or labeling in general, because it helps you select relevant examples to annotate first quite quickly. In this video, we're basically going to be doing the same thing. We're definitely going to be using the same technique. It's just that we are no longer going to be using texts. We're going to be using images instead. So this larger pipeline is going to remain the same, but we should take a step back and consider that images are somewhat fundamentally different than text. So the way that we embed things might be different. And also the way that we might explore the space might be different as a result as well. So uh, let's get started by just talking about some ways that you can take an image and maybe embed that into an n-dimensional array. So let's try out something simple to start with. We are starting with an image and we want to get to this numeric representation. Then if we take this one example image, one thing that we can try and do is we can try and think about what information is actually in it. Uh, and in particular, an image is just a collection of pixels. So one thing that you could do is you could have a look at a pixel value, uh, which is typically encoded as a red, green, and a blue number. Uh, so for example, this red pixel over here would have a very high red value and very low green and blue values. Um, and you can do that for one pixel, but uh, you can also do that for more. Uh, if you take a pixel of the cat, uh, because it's a somewhat darker cat, uh, I would assume the red, green, and blue values to be uh, somewhat lower. But um, those are just two pixels, and what you can do is you can actually look at all of them. Uh, there's the first pixel, and you can just skip over and uh, have a look at all of them. Now, when you do that, uh, you can start aggregating some information. Um, after all, what you can do is you can take all of the pixels and then you can use them to fill histograms. The way that this would work is you would make a histogram for the red, the green, and the blue colors. And for this particular image, you can imagine that um, there would be some points that have very high red values, which is why if you make a histogram of all of these points, um, you would expect a bit of a hill at the uh, higher values for red. Green and blue would be less spiky, but let's pretend that these are the histograms that we can make out of all of these separate pixels. Then what we could do is we can bucket them. Uh, we can determine some sort of resolution that we are interested in. Uh, and we can say, well, uh, these histograms, uh, we have all of these separate values for all of these separate buckets. We do it for the red, the green, and the blue histogram. But then uh, you do end up with some numbers. In this case, I have eight buckets per histogram, so I'd end up with 24 numbers. But this can be used to make a representation. The big picture idea here is to take our example image, then from all of these pixels, make all these separate histograms, and then at the end, the one thing we just do is we concatenate them together. And this would also be able to give us a single array of numbers. 
And there you go. That's your n-dimensional array. You can add or remove some buckets if you'd like, but this is a approach to take that one image and to represent that as an array. So that means as far as our pipeline goes, we have the first part. We are able to take our images and just embed them. And that means if we want to apply some bulk labeling, well, what we need to do is still apply UMAP and we can write a script that does this. Um, but this is the basic approach that we can start with. As we'll see, there are some downsides of using this embedding technique, but I do think it's a nice demo. So what I will do now is I'll uh, take this approach and I will apply this to some emoji images uh, just to get an impression of what we can expect when we do bulk labeling with these images. All right, uh, demo time. So uh, I'm inside of Visual Studio Code here. And what I've got is this uh, downloads folder. Inside of that, there is this uh, Twitter emoji folder. And in there, there are just tons of images uh, of emojis that you uh, can see on Twitter. Uh, Twitter has been nice enough to uh, make these openly available. So I figured it would be kind of fun to do something with color histograms in uh, these images. So as a preparation script uh, over here, uh, I made a little pipeline. And I'm not gonna go too much into the details. Uh, I'm using a little helper library here to help me out. Uh, but the main part of the code that's doing all the work uh, is happening uh, here. This is why I'm constructing a scikit-learn pipeline that's going through all these different steps. Um, what I'm assuming is that there is a CSV file with a path column. Um, this component is going to grab that. Then I have this other component that is able to take a image path and then load that into memory as an image. That will then be passed to a color histogram encoder, which is going to make these arrays that I mentioned. And then that is going to be passed into UMAP uh, to get this two-dimensional array. Uh, and then I'm scaling it just to make the chart just a little bit nicer. Uh, but this is the pipeline that's doing uh, pretty much all of the heavy lifting. And then below here, the main thing that's really happening is I'm loading in uh, all the different uh, paths of all of these different uh, images. Um, I'm putting all those paths in a data frame uh, and then I'm taking a data frame, applying the pipeline, um, and then I'm saving a new uh, CSV file out uh, that has all these file paths and these two dimensional coordinates. Uh, let me just show you that file just for good measure. Uh, that file looks like this. It's a CSV file with uh, a path. This is a path of one of those images. Uh, it also has an X coordinate and a Y coordinate, as you can see over here. Um, so that means that for every single image, uh, I have a two-dimensional coordinate that I can chart. Uh, and that's enough for the uh, bulk command line util uh, to do its work. So let's just run that. Uh, I can call python-m bulk with some help. And then here you can see that uh, bulk now also provides uh, an image uh, API, which we're going to be using. So bulk image. And then I'm going to be passing it the uh, Twitter emoji CSV file. And when I do that, um, I get an interface that looks like this uh, inside of a browser. Now, what you're looking at here is very similar to what we had with text. Um, I still have this two-dimensional chart with some uh, clusters around that I can select. Um, but the main thing that's a bit different is if I now select one of these clusters, uh, let's go for this one then instead of showing text here, I'm just showing all the different images. Um, and what's kind of interesting here is I seem to have a cluster with blue things, um, lots of swimming activities, it seems. Uh, let's go for another cluster, maybe this one. Right, lots of hand signals, but I believe the skin color um, is the main feature here. I'll try a few more. These are all black colors. Okay, we've got like animal skin colors, maybe this one over here, that's bright purple. All right, so there you go. Um, we are able to uh, use color histograms to uh, construct these clusters. And you can clearly see that that information is actually being captured as well. Um, so that's cool, it's a, a cute trick. Um, it's not gonna be super useful uh, just yet though, because you can wonder, well, the information from an image, the color, is that really the information I'm interested in? Uh, I can imagine maybe some use cases with satellite images where if you're interested in figuring out if there's a forest, sure, uh, color histograms might help you out a bit there. Um, but if I were to now go to a slightly more realistic use case, uh, we're gonna see that this is not going to be helping us uh, that much. 
Um, so I will now do the same thing, but uh, on a different data set. Okay, so I am back in Visual Studio Code over here. Um, and what I'm going to do now is just repeat the same script, uh, but for this other data set called Pets. Uh, this data set just contains lots of images of pets, so mainly dogs and cats, uh, but all sorts of different cat breeds and all sorts of different dog breeds. And as you can kind of guess, you can wonder, well, is color really the main information in the image that I'm interested in? Because if we're not careful, we might just be overfitting on the color of the background of the image. Uh, and also, cats and dogs can just be of the same color. So uh, just to show that uh, that's not going to work so well, I basically uh, grabbed the make emoji script. Uh, but now I'm just uh, pointing it to a different folder. I'm pointing it to this pets folder over here, um, which is the folder uh, right there. And I've ran the script for a thousand examples because I think that's sufficient. Uh, and I've saved that to this pets.csv file. And if I were now to run this, then once again, I get to see a similar interface. Uh, but if I now make a selection here, then yeah, it seems like I have lots of dark colors over here, but the cats and dogs are all mixed up. Um, let's grab another part over here. Here we see lots of light colors. Uh, let's go over here. Also light colors over here, a little bit more of a bluish background. So although color histograms kind of serve me very well as a vehicle to explain uh, encoding for images, it is also pretty clear right now that we're going to need something else. If I'm interested in getting very meaningful clusters over here, then I do need to concern myself a little bit more with how these images are being represented numerically. Um, and as we've just seen, just colors on themselves are not going to be uh, super useful in uh, just many of these applications. So uh, let's do a bit more theory then. So let's discuss another way of creating numeric representations for an image, uh, and that is by using convolutional neural networks. Um, I'm definitely going to glance over lots of details in my explanations of these models, and I'll link to some extra material in the show notes. But very roughly speaking, these are models that come in two parts. Um, the first part would take an, uh, an image, like this example image over here, uh, and then it would apply some convolutional layers on it. Um, these are layers that, roughly speaking, kind of go over the original image with this moving box, so to say, trying to find interesting features, things like edges, for example, that's something they might be able to detect, especially in the early layers, let's say. And I would argue that this beginning part of the neural network is a convolutional pooling layer part. This is typically at the beginning when it sees an image. These are the layers that you can expect there in these sorts of models. After a while though, after we've had lots of these layers, typically um, things get flattened. We no longer have these uh, sort of two-dimensional moving parts that look over the uh, image. Uh, after a while it just gets turned into a flattened, dense uh, layer. Now the idea here is, of course, that the final layer of this network kind of represents the classes that we're trying to predict. There's an activation function such that we have probability values, let's say. But the thing with these final layers is, if we are predicting a couple of classes that are going to be very relevant, then these final dense layers should also have a representation um, that's related to those classes. So you could also say here that, hey, maybe those final dense layers of my convolutional network maybe those can become very interesting representations that I can go ahead and use for bulk labeling. And the thinking here is that suppose that we have this pre-trained uh, convolutional model that's been trained on a whole lot of classes, some of which are related to the task that we are interested in, then odds are that we have a network uh, that is able to detect features that we are also interested in ourselves. And that means that one of these final layers uh, can be seen as an array that describes lots of uh, information that we are just also interested in. So that's all very good, and we can find these pre-trained models online, but we do have to remember that there are some caveats. For example, we have to be pretty sure that if we have a pre-trained model that they are trained on a data set that is somewhat similar to what we are interested in. For example, if we are dealing with a data set of wild animals, that's great, but that is a little bit different than images of pets. Pets are usually 
photographed indoors, and then you could wonder if maybe this will confuse the pre-trained model. Similarly, uh, you can have a pre-trained model on satellite images or medical images, and it's also not going to help you much if you're trying to detect cats from dogs, let's say. And furthermore, you should also consider that some neural networks have been trained with a different task in mind. Some convolutional models are trained to be very fast, to be ran on mobile devices, whereas other ones are maybe a fair bit slower, but they are able to be more accurate and maybe have learned more useful information. Another thing we should also keep in back of our minds is that these models can be slow, especially if these models are very big and large. Um, so that also means that there's a practical consideration here, especially if you don't have access to a GPU. Finally, another kind of open problem is that we also have to wonder, well, which dense layer do we pick at the end? Uh, we could pick the final layer, the layer that has uh, all the class predictions and that can hold valid information, but you might also want to pick the layer just in front of that. And especially if these models are kind of big, there might be more than one dense layer to pick from, and that's also something to keep in the back of your minds. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to give another quick demo where I'm going to take the same pets data set that I had before, and then I'm going to pass it through uh, two pre-trained models. Uh, I'll pass it through the exception model uh, and through MobileNet. All right, um, so once again, I am back in Visual Studio Code. And in front of me, I've got this script called makepets.py. Uh, it is very similar to the color histogram uh, script that we saw earlier, but this time I am constructing a slightly different pipeline. Instead of going with a color histogram over here, I am going with a Tim encoder. And Tim is short for the PyTorch image models uh, library. Uh, I made a little wrapper for that. Um, and what I can do is I can pass a name of a pre-trained model, uh, and then this will uh, encode all the images uh, using a pre-trained convolutional network. So effectively what I'm doing here is I'm going to be making two of these pipelines, one for exception and uh, one for mobile net. Um, the exception model is a bigger model, more meant for accuracy, uh, and mobile net is more meant to be the lightweight model, more meant for mobile phones. So that is good to keep in the back of your mind. Um, but as far as the script then goes, it's really similar to what I did before. It's just that I will now have uh, two files on disk, uh, one for MobileNet and uh, one for Exception. Uh, and we're gonna have a look at the Exception model in a bit, uh, but let's first have a look at uh, the bulk interface uh, using MobileNet. Okay, so this is the MobileNet interface. Uh, one thing that I can kind of see here is that it's one big blob which usually means it's having trouble finding clusters. Uh, let's just select a corner. Let's go for this one. Um, don't see the clearest pattern. Let's go for another corner. Okay, we do see uh, most of the dogs here seem to be pugs. So, okay, we got a pattern over here, I suppose. And here I'm having a bit of trouble seeing a clear pattern. I guess most of these are cats. Um, I do find it interesting that I seem to have a couple of duplicates, but as I just uh, tried this out a couple of times, um, it's kind of hard to cherry pick examples where there's actually a proper cluster. Um, so keep that in mind as I'm gonna contrast this now by going back. And now instead of running MobileNet, I'm gonna run the uh, exception uh, variant instead. And now what you can kind of see is that at least it's not a round blob anymore. It's a bit more of a shape. Um, so let's now select some clusters of points. There's seems to be something in the corner over here. And uh, these all seem to be smaller Chihuahua type dogs. Let, let's now grab a cluster over here. These all seem to be small dogs with big ears that are dark. These are all Pomerians, if I'm not mistaken. And when I grab a cluster over here, it does seem like we have a cluster with mainly cats in them. I mean, there's a dog, right? But uh, by and large, these are cats. So there you go. I, I grabbed another little cluster over here. And again, I seem to have found something with... Uh, mainly uh, cats in them. Uh, it's not perfect. I mean, uh, this is a dog over here, but um, if nothing else, it does seem like the 
patterns that Exception has learned are more useful to me if I'm interested in distinguishing cats from dogs. Um, I definitely have that feeling. So one lesson here, uh, if you're going to be doing this, there's something to be said uh, to research your models a bit, uh, not just on what data they've been trained, uh, but if you're looking for meaningful vectors, maybe going for the bigger model makes sense. Uh, but I also want to maybe zoom out a bit here to say that uh, these embeddings or this uh, clustered representation, so to say, uh, still does not feel ideal. Um, I still need to do a bit of cherry picking. There's actually a lot of effort that I need to do um, to be able to just make quick selections of cats and dogs. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to apply a trick to actually make this very easy. Uh, there is something that we can do here with fine tuning um, that is something that's also quite general. So uh, once again, a little bit of theory. So let's consider the approach that we have right now. Uh, we take an image and then we pass that through some sort of pre-trained model. Um, we kind of hope that the pre-trained model has a couple of classes that are going to be relevant to us, or at least something similar. And then we're going to say, well, let's grab some sort of numerical representation somewhere at the end of the model, uh, and then we'll use that to feed our bulk labeling approach. And this could work, but we do need to get kind of lucky. That's the downside of this approach, um, especially with images. Uh, finding the right pre-trained model can really take a while. So uh, let's see if we can instead maybe use this as a Lego brick to build on top of. So we're back at our drawing of our model. We have our pre-trained model with the convolutional layers in the beginning and some dense layers at the end. And what I'm proposing that we do is we just attach a new block of a model on top of this. Um, we can call this a new task head, so to say. And note that you could do this by taking the final layer of the pre-trained model. Uh, you can also remove the final layer and use the layer before that. The main idea, though, is that we have a new head on our architecture and that this head will also, at the end of it, have the class that we care about that we are going to be predicting. And here's the thinking and the reasoning behind doing this. If we now start training uh, this entire system, and again, um, we are taking our image and it's going to get embedded and that result is going to go to our new task head, then we might get some classification errors, which we can then translate to this gradient update that's going to update the weights of our new task head. Note that what I'm also proposing is that we freeze the pre-trained model and that we don't update any of those weights. Uh, I'm mainly proposing this to keep this lightweight. Uh, if we only need to do a gradient update on that final layer, uh, that's going to be much faster than if we have to retrain the entire model. But if we think about what we might then expect from this hidden layer just before our classification node, well, then we might have something that's actually kind of interesting. The representation over here technically kind of blends the information that the pre-trained model has with the information of our class. And that also means that technically, uh, by just attaching our own class this way, we might be able to just steer the embedding uh, towards what we are interested in just by annotating a few examples. If we have a few examples of the classes that we like, um, then maybe just those few examples will be enough to get a way better representation in the middle that we can then use for bulk labeling again. What's especially interesting about this approach is that you might not even need to have many annotations. Uh, so what I'm about to do is I'm just going to start labeling maybe 20 examples per class or so um, using Prodigy. And then the results that I have from that labeling are going to be used to train this new task head. And then we'll see what that does to the embeddings in our bulk labeling interface. And we are once again back in Visual Studio Code. Um, I'm about to annotate some images that I can use to fine tune my uh, new task head. Um, and what I've done just in preparation is I've made this folder called to annotate of just some examples of cat and dog photos. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'll be using the Prodigy Mark recipe. Prodigy works with recipes, which are these annotation uh, interfaces. Uh, but the one thing that's kind of nice about the Mark recipe is that it's very flexible. Uh, what you're allowed to do is you're allowed to say, well, um, here's the kind of data that you'll be loading. And here is the annotation interface uh, that needs to be attached. 
And this way you can very flexibly say, oh, here's audio that I want to have classified, or here are images that I would like to have classified. It's just a nice recipe that uh, not everyone knows about, so I did want to give a bit of attention to it. Um, but this is going to be enough for me to start annotating. Uh, so let's hit run here. And when I do this, a server starts up um, and it has some images of cats and dogs. So I'm just gonna quickly annotate a few. Uh, note that I'll be using keyboard shortcuts to hit these buttons. Uh, I can hit A for accept. Um, these are all cats. But after a while, uh, you will also notice that there is this image of a dog. So that means I'm gonna hit uh, this one over here. Uh, to reject it, but uh, that's also X uh, on the keyboard. And I think I'm done with the images uh, that I needed. Um, and one thing I just wanted to mention for good measure, uh, what I've just done real quick is I've only annotated uh, about 50 examples. Um, 23 cats and 27 dogs to be precise. So that really wasn't much effort. Um, but let's pay attention now to what happens if I just pre-train on this small set. Um, because it is pretty interesting what's going to happen. Right, um, so time to show off some custom code. Uh, what I'm about to do is show you all the steps that you need to uh, train your own custom task head. Uh, but there's a couple of tricks in this notebook, so I'm just going to go through all the separate steps. I'm going to start by just uh, importing a whole lot of things here, but uh, also you're going to see the familiar uh, embedding pipeline. So. Uh, grabbing a column, uh, loading up the images, and then again, uh, exception uh, via the uh, Tim library. So that is our pre-trained part of the network, so to say. Uh, I can use this uh, to generate my features for all of these separate images. And that's what I'm doing below um, over here. Now, what I've done off camera is I've made this uh, folder called cat dog. Uh, there's a folder called cat with all the images that I've labeled uh, that are a cat. And I've done the same thing um, for dogs. So that means that I have all of my cat paths and all of my dog paths. Um, I'm making a data frame over here that has uh, all of them. But then I also have a label now that I can get out of that. Uh, I don't just have my representations from my pipeline. I also have proper labels. Uh, that is to say, uh, zero or one, is this a cat, yes, no. So, so far so good. But now I'm going to do a kind of a nice little trick that you can do with Keras. Uh, that's a deep learning library that's uh, built on top of TensorFlow these days. And what I'm doing in this function over here called make model is I am building uh, technically two models at the same time. Uh, the way that this works is I'm able to say there's a model uh, that has inputs. Then after that, I'm saying, well, there's a dense layer over here that's receiving these inputs. And uh, that's a dense layer with uh, 50 nodes. And then I have an output layer. And that output layer receives uh, the output of this dense layer over here. Uh, and that, of course, only has one output because it's either a cat or a dog. It's the uh, final part of the neural network. But what I can do is I can say, well, Let's define two models then. Uh, let's have uh, this be a model. And let's have this be a model. And by defining it this way, if I train this outermost model, I will also train this innermost model and have a reference to it, which means that by training on the Y label, uh, I also can grab this dense representation out afterwards. And that's because uh, I'm exporting both models. Here I'm exporting a model that goes from the inputs to the outputs, and here I've got another model that takes the same inputs, but it outputs this dense layer um, in the middle. And you can also see that uh, when I'm actually calling this model over here. I have my prediction model and my uh, embedding model. And if you're familiar with Keras, um, the next few steps here are a bit standard. Uh, I'm saying let's compile. Um, I'm taking my prediction model uh, I'm passing it an optimizer, I'm uh, giving it metrics I want to track, and I'm saying, hey, uh, this is the loss that I'm trying to optimize for. Uh, then I can call fit, uh, and I'm only doing this for a few epochs. Uh, and then here you can see over time that, uh, you know, um, accuracy is improving. 
uh, I could go for more steps at this point, but I figured, hey, uh, let's keep this fast. So uh, this takes maybe a few seconds or so, uh, and I think this is good enough. And why is this sufficient now? I, I could go on and get like a better accuracy, but I'm more interested to see what happens with that embedding. I'm more interested in seeing what information got captured by the extra intermediate layer that I added. Um, so to visualize that, uh, there's a little bit of extra code. And the main thing that I'm doing is I'm saying, well, let's make that two-dimensional chart again um, with the UMAP clusters, but I'm making two variants. The one over here is all of my images that come out of the pre-trained exception model. So no fancy things with a custom task head happening there. But here, I'm taking my embedding model and I'm giving the output of this embedding model to UMAP. And here's what it looks like when I plot this. And again, uh, these are the two-dimensional UMAP points uh, when I just look at what comes out of exception. This is no custom task on top yet. Um, and you see it's kind of one big blob and there might be some smaller clusters here, but just notice how the shape changes if I am now going to use the embeddings from that little dense layer in the custom task head, uh, because that looks like this. And you immediately notice it's a completely different shape, but moreover, you can kind of see that it almost feels like there's a line being drawn here. And that might make you wonder, is it the case that maybe one end over here is cats and the other one is dogs uh, or vice versa? Um, because it definitely seems like something else has been picked up here. There's a different pattern at play. So as a final demo, what I would like to do is just show you what this looks like uh, when I load it up in bulk. So as a final step below here as well, I am saving these points uh, to disk. Uh, but what I'm going to now do is I'm going to load up this uh, pets fine tuned.csv file just to see what kind of pattern got picked up. So I am uh, back in Visual Studio Code. I see pets fine tuned over here. Uh, so let's open that one up. Bulk image pets fine tuned. And there we are. Um, I'm going to start by just selecting uh, some points from this region over here. And uh, yeah, these are all cats on one end. Uh, let's deselect that. And now I'm going to select some points here. And yeah, they're all dogs. So that's pretty cool, I think. Um, by just annotating a few images and putting that on top of a pre-existing network, um, we get so much better embeddings for bulk labeling. It's just so much easier um, to select an area that we might be interested in. Now, one thing that I think is particularly cool, um, when I'm very much at the edge of one of these spectrums, um, it's very clear that these are cats, um, still cats, uh, still cats. But if I go to the middle here, there is this little region where um, maybe the model's not sure what's happening there. And when I have a look here, then yeah, I can kind of imagine why this photo of this cat might be mistaken as a dog. And I kind of get why this photo of a dog might be mistaken as a cat. So it seems like we end up with a representation where we can select either from a region where the model seems to be confident it's a dog or a region where the model's very confident it might be a cat or a region where the model's just not really confident, so we might get good examples to select first for that reason. And this, I think, is super exciting and cool, because this is almost like a human-in-the-loop variant of active learning. Uh, just by annotating a few examples, we'll be much better at this bulk labeling, which in turn can give us a better model, which in turn can make us better at bulk labeling. And if we use these pre-trained uh, models effectively, uh, we might only need a couple of data points annotated with Prodigy um, to get the ball rolling. This is also a way of working that I really like. It's definitely iterating on our data uh, while having a human in the loop that's trying to steer the annotation process as well. Um, and definitely when you're getting started, this can be very powerful. So I hope you enjoyed that demo. Uh, what I would now like to do just to wrap up is to reflect um, and to consider maybe some of the lessons learned.
Right. So hopefully that was a really cool demo for you. But looking back, I also think there are some general lessons maybe worth repeating here at the end. First and foremost, uh, I really do think that this fine tuning and annotating combination is quite powerful. Uh, given a pre-trained model and just a few annotations, we did see how this bulk labeling could become a whole lot more powerful because you're kind of able to steer the representation um, into something that you're interested in. So that was definitely a very cool observation. Next, what I also think is nice to maybe mention, um, this technique assumes that you just have a pre-trained model and you have them for images, text, and audio. So theoretically, at least, um, you should also be able to use this technique for those. But I do want to be a little bit careful and I don't want to promise too much because I do think also here there is no free lunch. Uh, you are going to need a little bit of luck when using this technique, and that's mainly due to the pre-trained model. You really got to hope that the model is big enough and that it has been trained on a domain that's also of interest to you. And if that's not the case, then you definitely will need to annotate more than what I've just done in this video in order to get the ball rolling. You can, of course, also start from scratch, but I'm pretty sure you'll need more than 50 uh, annotations to get the ball rolling. One thing I've also learned here is that pre-trained models for images are a little bit different than text. I can't really put my finger on it, but it has felt in the past that it's pretty easy to just grab a reasonable pre-trained text model. Whereas for this simple example, I did feel like I had to do more research. There are lots of pre-trained models out there, and I did notice that MobileNet, for example, really didn't perform as well as Exception. And you might have similar experiences as well. So it is good to maybe spend a little bit more time researching the different models out there. Another thing I also want to repeat is that bulk labels can still have errors. When you make a selection in the interface and it seems like they're all dogs, there might still be a couple of cats in between them. And that is something to keep in the back of your mind. Bulk labeling as a technique is more meant as a pre-processing step before you put everything into Prodigy, because having these bulk labels attached might make it a lot quicker to annotate uh, images but you really shouldn't assume that all these bulk labels will be perfect when you select a region. There will be some bad labels in there too. Another thing I've also learned is that the mark recipe in Prodigy is actually surprisingly powerful. I don't mind writing my own recipes, but it is really nice to have this flexible recipe where you can just select a loader and a view ID. That one recipe really does cover a lot of ground, so definitely check that out if you haven't already. And I think a final comment may be good to mention is that this whole bulk labeling technique feels very good for getting started, but it might not be a technique that you're going to use a lot later. And the main reason why I think that is because eventually you are also going to be iterating on your annotation interface, you're going to think more about the application of your problem. So even though this technique is really great for getting your first model out there, steps that follow probably will require more fine tuning, and that's probably not going to happen in bulk. So the main thing I suppose to get across here is that this demo might also be applicable to you. Uh, so please feel free to repeat that, um, but it's not going to solve every problem for you.